Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. It's very exciting to be here. And I would like to thank you all, the few who remained here till the end and stuck with us to listen to me babbling nonsense to you. And I would like to give a big thanks to Tikal for organizing this and allowing me to do this to you. So, thank you. So, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm, a, I'm Sari Al-Alam. I'm a Palestinian from East Jerusalem. Uh, married to my supportive wife, who is here today to support me. Thank you. Thank you. We have a four-year-old son who is not as supportive. He decided to stay in the kindergarten today. And that's our family. My hobbies are drawing and painting, not juggling. Um, and during my, on the professional side, during my career, it's a more than 12 years career, I had, to, I had the chance to wear so many different hats. QA, team lead, developer. I had a chance to co-found a, a startup with a friend of mine. It failed miserably, but I still learned a lot from it. And in the last few years, I've been working at Soluto as an architect, where we worked with very high-scale systems, serving millions of customers, where a simple failure that goes into production has a lot of impact, it has a lot of potential to cost us a lot. Which brings me to this part. Probably most of you uh, have heard about the sad news that Soluto is closing. Um, it's really sad to see this amazing place close. I've been there for three years, started as a senior developer, and in the last year I've been working there as an architect with multiple teams. Amazing people, amazing place, amazing products, and um, very challenging um, problems that we need to solve um, to serve millions of customers in high scale. Um, it's really sad to see that go. So I'm honored to have one last chance to represent Saluto and the people of Saluto. Okay, let's get this started. Click. Okay. Um, so we're, we're in a fast-moving world, and us as developers, we need to continue moving fast to match that pace. And with that comes, you know, working with different me development methodologies. Agile, microservices, multiple deployments a day. We need to keep moving fast. And with that comes risk, risk of something happening in production with those multiple deployments a day. So what do we try to do to minimize this risk? First of all, we usually try to write good code and do good code reviews. We can actually use AI as some as Dror, I think, Dror, yeah, Dror said in, in an earlier presentation to help us with this. Uh, then after that, we can write uh, tests, unit, the black box, integration, end to end, you name it, all in an effort to minimize that risk. On top of that, we also start creating metrics, graphs, to help us see if something happens once we do the deployment so that we would be aware of it and act upon it. Even with all this preparation, something still happens and the bug slips into production, making us go into panic mode, trying to save the day, and eventually we investigate and solve the problem. And once we do that, we start asking ourselves, why did that happen? Now, there, there can be multiple reasons for that, and I'll, I'll just focus on a few that are more relevant to this topic. One um, cause might be a resource issue on production. And it's hard to test this kind of thing because resources like CPU and memory in production are not as easily tested as other things. On our test environment, development environment, it's simply different. It's, it's really difficult to match it. Second, it might be an unexpected traffic or usage by our customers. Again, this comes into the case that production is always different than our test environments, production environments. It can be also caused by as simple as a missed test case. All of these reasons tell us one thing, that we still need another layer of, production, of protection, sorry, protecting production. So this is where the canary release strategy comes into play which is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'll explain a little bit about what is a canary release strategy in the backend world and how it can help us in these situations, how it can reduce the risk. Second, I'll explain what is Argo rollouts and how it adopts canary and how we can adopt that. 
third, I'll explain a little bit about, not a little bit, I'll explain uh, somewhat about strategies um, for doing a canary rollout. There is no one solution to say, okay, here's uh, the best canary strategy for, uh, for everything. It depends on your use case, my use case, another's use case. So there's no one solution to rule them all. I'll explain a little bit about the different factors that you can take into consideration so you can decide on the strategy that fits you and your use case. Finally, we'll, I'll talk about the learnings that me and my colleagues learned about when we used our rollouts for a while uh, to implement the canary release strategy in our backend. Okay, let's get this going. What is a canary release strategy? In the backend world, let's suppose uh, you're using Kubernetes. You have your uh, production code running on two pods, for example. Let's call them stable pods. And let's tag them with V1. Now you want to release something new. You develop the code, you make a deployment. In a canary rollout strategy, instead of replacing those pods, you just start another instance with your new code in it. Let's call it canary pod tag it with V2, and both of them run, run alongside each other in parallel. Now, alongside that, while they are running, you have your metrics provider. Um, a famous, the most famous example is Prometheus, which is something that is collecting metrics that you expose in your code, and it's collecting it on a, uh, on a constant basis. Now, this is where the Canary Orchestrator comes in. A Canary Orchestrator is um, a core component of any Canary release uh, solution that you might see or might use. In our case, it will be Argo Rollouts. What it does is that while everything is running here, it does two things. First one is it manages traffic. It splits traffic between the stable code and the Canary code so that a small percentage of your customer's traffic goes into your canary code. This is a big win if you look at it, because if something wrong happens here in that canary pod, only a small percentage of your customers are impacted. And at the same time, you're testing your code on production. So that's what, what we win out of a canary rollout strategy. That's the main strength point. Meanwhile, the second thing that it does is that on a constant basis, the canary orchestrator uh, gets input, a query, and an expected result. It's something that we provide. A query is a query that we write, uh, which measures how good our code is performing in production. And the expected result is our threshold. That's we say, OK, below this point, we consider the, the, the code not good, let's roll back. So it will use those two pieces of information to constantly query our metrics provider uh, for the canary code. And based on the results, it will either decide to move forward or roll back. Roll ba rolling back is simply just you know, killing this pod and move everything back as is. No, no, no harm done, except for the small percentage. And if everything is OK, it will just simply promote the canary pod to replace the stable pods. And this is done along uh, a long-running uh, process multiple times. So this is what is a canary release strategy look, looks like. And the win from this, as I said, is the exposure to any issue is very minimal to customers. And it's an automatic process of rolling back and then promoting to uh, the next phase. How does Argo rollout um, play into this picture? How does it click? OK, so how, how does Argo rollout uh, adopt this, and how can we use it? Use it. So Argo rollouts is a solution that you can install into your Kubernetes-based cluster. It adds custom resources, the controller, which is the orchestrator that we explained, that allows you to add to use custom rollout strategies, like blue-green experiments and Canary, which is the topic for today. Argo rollouts is part of the Argo project. Um, you probably know the famous Argo CD, and there's also Argo events, notifications, and other products that integrate very well with each other. And if you use all of them together, you get a lot out of them along with Argo rollouts. We'll talk about uh, some of them uh, during this talk. Argo rollouts, uh, I think April this year, maybe last year, but it's, it was April. 
Uh, it was incubated by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, so it has the backing it needs, it needs the support it needs to stay, so you don't need to worry about it fading away anytime soon. Okay, so we have our rollouts installed in our Kubernetes cluster. How do we um, use it? Now, as usual, using your Kubernetes manifests, the YAML files, uh, you have, for example, your deployment YAML files. It's a very simple change, nothing much to do, other than just changing the kind from deployment to rollout. And this allows us to use all the different strategies that our rollouts provides by uh, configuring a release strategy other than the default ones that Kubernetes uses, like rolling update or uh, recreate uh, strategies, which are provided by default by Kubernetes, you can now use Canary. And the definition is very straightforward. If you remember the, how the Canary release strategy works, it's pretty much translated here. Setting the percentage, routing 5% of the per percentage of the traffic to the Canary pod, let it run for two hours, let's say, increase the, the traffic, and then run the analysis. So it's pretty much straightforward, step one, two, three, four. But specifically here, I want to talk about two points. How does Argo rollouts manage traffic? And what does the analysis look like in Argo rollouts? So Argo rollouts manages traffic in two different ways, and uh, that was one of the main selling points for us at Saluto to use Argo rollouts, because it's pretty flexible from that point, from that point of view. The first one is that it uses the pod count and I'll explain how that works in a second. In this method, it's actually a method that you can use in your vanilla Kubernetes, and I'll explain why uh, in a few minutes. Let's suppose you have two stable pods running, and you release uh, code in, uh, in, uh, to start another one canary pod. In this approach, Argo allows delegates the traffic management to the uh, vanilla Kubernetes service object. And if you guys are familiar with a service object, you might know that a service object is acting as a load balancer, very traditional load balancer that evenly splits traffic between the pods. So in this case, it will only be exactly like this. These two pods will, pods will get 66%, and this one will get 33%. It's just an even split. So if we want to do 50-50, then we need two canary pods, two stable pods. What will happen if we want to do 10%? You can see where this is going, right? So it's a huge waste of resource. Just to manage traffic, we need to add more and more pods. It's, it's costing money and time, actually, in the, in the whole process itself. So that's a big disadvantage. But this is a very great solution if you have a vanilla Kubernetes install installation. If you don't have a vanilla Kubernetes installation, for example, you have a service mesh installed on top of your Kubernetes uh, cluster, then you can, you can use the second approach which is more optimal. Um, in this approach, it, it Algor allows delegates the traffic management to the virtual service that Link RD, RD or Istio provides. And traffic management can be as granular as you, as you want without wasting any kind of resources here. So you have these two approaches, depending on what your Kubernetes cluster looks like. You can work with both. And you know the advantages and disadvantages of the first one. Now, moving on to the second part, which is the analysis in Argo rollouts. This is the, um, the part where you define how your analysis will look like. How often do we want to measure our code? What do we want to measure? Uh, what, our, what is our failure threshold? How long should the analysis run? All of this is being provided here in the analysis template in Argo rollouts, and it's pretty much straightforward. Uh, in this example, I just added Prometheus, as the, you know, the metrics provider that we query against, but it supports uh, Datadog and much more uh, providers. So now we know how uh, to install uh, Argo, configure it, and create a, a Canary rollout, which brings us to, the second qu to this question. How does, the, how does my Canary rollout should look like? What is a good Canary rollout? And, and I, as I said in the beginning, there is no single solution, you know, one ring to rule them all. It's, it's a set of uh, different factors that you need to take into consideration to fit your own use case. You can do the research. You will see a lot of terms come up. Um, and, but I would like here to focus on two things. What are the items 
what what are the items or the things that you should look at and measure or you can measure and take into consideration and then how the how to measure those so let's start with the first according to google's sre book um, if you want to measure how well your code is performing you need to take a look at four core um, metrics called the four golden signals first one is success rate i think it's pretty much straightforward the percentage of your success operations error rate which is a direct correlation of success rate and then latency which is how long does it take to finish an operation whether it's success or error regardless Finally, saturation, which is an indication of how close are we to fully utilizing our resources, CPU, memory, etc. Now, some of these are easier to measure than others. Some are more difficult, like saturation. And it's just a matter of what, how much are you willing to invest, because measuring these involves you, know, you exposing metrics, measuring those, capturing those metrics, uh, and making sure that they're correct. In the end, you can also make use of the fact that some of them are actually kind of, not fully, but a kind of a proxy to others. So error rate is kind of a proxy to success because there is a direct correlation. Latency is also something close to saturation because the closer we are to fully utilizing our CPU, it will manifest itself as latency. You know, high CPU usage, slower processing rate. It's not 100% replacement. It's a a proxy that you can compromise to use. So giving, all, uh, the, giving you all of these factors, now you can decide what you want to measure, and comes next the how are you going to measure those. Now, this is a very difficult thing, question to answer also. Although it's just one word, it's very difficult to answer that. Um, it's up to you, to your use case. So I'll talk about our use case in Saluto, the different factors we took, and hopefully that will give you an idea about what, what to think about when you're going through this practice. So our uh, Canary rollout strategy uh, was split into three different uh, stages. And we can run a Canary rollout in, in hours or days, uh, to, to continue running in days or hours. We can measure different things, but this is what we went for. And I'll explain every part of it as we go. Step one. Um, we call it the fail-fast step. It routed 5% of the traffic to the canary pod and ran for 13 minutes, and at the end, it decided to continue or roll back, um, which is enough time for us to collect 50 data points. What does each of these mean? So, sorry, back. So, fail-fast, uh, we call it fail, we want it a fail-fast step because as I said in the beginning, this, every, like with the, us developers, we like to keep moving fast. We want to develop fast, deliver features fast, deploy fast, see our change go into production as fast as possible. And canary rollout is a very long running process, hours or days, actually. Some, some companies do days of running a canary, which at the end of the canary analysis, you will get an answer if your code is OK or not being rolled back. And that's pretty much, fr that's very frustrating for developers. Um, developers want to continue moving fast. So this step acted as like of a kind of a smoke test on production, where it will test everything on production. And for 13 minutes, developers will get an answer roughly, get an answer if their code has something major wrong in the code. Um, so it was kind of a compromise and a conveniency for developers, uh, more or less. Why 5%? Because, I mean, the recommendation is that if 5% is the minimum, because less than 5%, you're now risking an unreliable analysis. The analysis is running and measuring the metrics that are generating by traffic. If you have few customers using your service or your platform or your uh, infrastructure, then the metrics you're getting out of it are not as reliable as uh, you might expect. So 5% is the minimum recommended value for a reliable analysis. Then moving to 13 minutes and 50 data points. Why these two things? Now 50 data points, just to make sure that we're on the same page, is 
50 data points that we collect as metrics. So we have Prometheus collecting metrics. It needs to collect metrics 50 times. Why 50? We followed the ARIMA model, which is a, uh, a statistical model that is used for um, analyzing and predicting time series data. This is a model that is usually used to, for predicting weather. So predicting weather, and we're dealing here with code. Why are we using the ARIMA model? Because this is what we're actually doing in the canary analysis. We're checking our code, and we're trying to predict if it's going to behave good or bad in the, if we keep it running in production. And in, our, in the ARIMA model, the recommendation that they say is that the minimum data point, number of data points in a time series data that you're analyzing should be at least 50 data points so that the analysis also be reliable. Um, and to be able to collect those 50 data points, our case, our Prometheus instance, I need, needed 13 minutes to collect all of these data points. So you just need to take into account the frequency of your um, uh, metrics provider, how often does it collect metrics, and from that you get all these numbers. So that's our uh, first step. Sorry, I missed this one. Then if everything was okay, it will move on to the second step. If not, it will just roll back, and that will be it. Second step is uh, setting the weight to 100%. Routing 10% of the traffic, let it run for one hour, and do the analysis six times with the query that we provide. And the query was a combination of uh, latency and success rate measurement. We do the same with the third step, 15%, another one hour, six times. 15% here is also uh, the recommended maximum of uh, the traffic that you route to your canary code because more than 15% is where you start having higher and higher risk of exposure to any potential issue. If something goes wrong, then you're exposing more and more customers to the issue. So this process is a total of two and two hours and 15 minutes. Um, in our case, we, couldn't, we want, I mean, running this longer than, uh, than that would be uh, problematic in terms of allowing, allowing us to continue moving fast, given the fact that we do a release only when we have high traffic volume. If we have low traffic volume, then the analysis is useless. So we do the release and do all this analysis, we deploy when we have the highest traffic possible. This is our um, canary loud strategy. I hope it helps you in the terms of the different consideration that we took into it. Um, so we took that, we let it run uh, for months, and this is these are our learnings from um, our usage of our rollouts and the canary rollout. First of all, uh, we instantly noticed that it does reduce risk. It helped us in multiple times where we int were introducing, by mistake of course, uh, introducing latency, um, higher latency into the code, bugs, uh, unexpected uh, issues. It really works, so it's highly recommended. Next, uh, we noticed that there was a specific case where it can crash production. It's doing the opposite. I'll explain it uh, about every point here uh, in the next slides, but I'll just mention them here quickly. Third, uh, visibility. Visibility is, all, is very important. It's never enough. That's what we learned. I'll talk about it also. Um, and then interactivity, where we need to allow the developers to interact with the process. So let's start with the first one where it can crash production. Let's take this case. Uh, you have production, you have your code running in production, three pods running, uh, and they are reading their environment variables from a config map in Kubernetes. You release your new code, it starts another canary pod, and for the sake of uh, managing traffic, Argo rollouts, uh, oh, sorry, it's also updating the config map. So your change is actually updating the config map, changing the environment variables to match your changes in, in the, your canary code. Now, for the sake of uh, managing traffic, Argo rollouts, uh, you know, downscales the stale replica set so that it's splitting 33% here, just for the sake of the example, and lets it run. Now, let's suppose that something wrong happens and Argo rollouts want to roll back. Now, it kills pod four and then tries to bring up pod three back again. Now imagine this case, pod three is trying to start up, it's trying to read the environment variables, but this wasn't rolled back. 
And pod three is actually now going into a crash loop, trying to read environment, non-existing environment variables, and is unable to start. Now, our goal allows is in a, in a situation where it's unable to roll back and unable to move forward. Now, that's, that's a deadlock. And it's actually a very difficult situation to be in. This case can actually happen in not just in config map changes, it can happen with any external dependency change, like changing uh, an SQL table, adding a column or altering a column, which will break your old code. My recommendation to avoid this situation is to make your changes backwards compatible when you're deploying something new, so that a rollback will not make, get you into this situation, so that your new code and old code will continue functioning with those external changes. Next, visibility. Um, so, Argo Rollouts provides a lot of visibility by providing us with dashboards that where you can expect the uh, canary rollout at any phase. If you're using Arco CD, you'll get the same. Um, but more importantly, is the metrics that the Argo Rollout orchestrator provides, the controller. You can use those metrics to visualize uh, them in dashboards and view historical data. For example, the canary rollout process, historically, what happened when, when did it complete, when it rolled back, and so on. And the most important part from my perspective is visualizing the uh, analysis query that you created. If you remember the part where we provide algo rollouts with a Prometheus query or whatever query for any provider that you use, Try visualizing this query. For example, you're measuring, you're analyz analyzing success rate. Visualize it, and if something goes wrong in the analysis, then you can take a look at this graph and say, okay, here there was a drop down, and I know that the success rate was the cause of my rollback. And you can visualize success rate, latency, saturation, or whatever that you're using in your query. This is very important. It can help your developers to find issues easily and then start the troubleshooting process. Now, the developers have the, vis the visibility they need. They need to act upon it, which brings us to, sorry, which brings us to the interactivity part. Now, um, so developers know that something wrong happened with the canary process, it's rolled back. They need to be able to act upon it. So they saw, for example, that they need to change the thresholds. It's not an issue, it's a matter of updating the thresholds. So you need to allow your developers to override the canary uh, process itself. Um, and you can achieve that by using, for example, uh, templates, uh, Helm templates. You can have, for example, a default canary rollout process. Your developers will overwrite with their values. Um, it's, it's a great capability to provide your developers the ability to do that. Otherwise, you as DevOps, if you're a DevOps uh, team member, you will be a bottleneck for them. Next, you need to allow the developers to interrupt and control the process. Let's suppose that we have an urgent fix that we need to, pull, to push into production, and we can't afford waiting for two hours or days for the canary process to finish. Um, we need to be able to avoid having a canary release uh, rollout analysis beginning and then waiting it for the end. So the developers need to have the ability to interrupt it or actually skip it all in all. Whether you're using Jenkins Codefresh for your CD operations, you need to be able to provide these capabilities but if you're using Argo CD, uh, you get that out of the box with just a, f a simple button click. Uh, I think this brings us to the end. So to sum everything up now, um, in a canary rollout strategy, if you want to implement one, do not route less than 5% or more than 15%. So 5 to 15% is, uh, is an acceptable range. Less than that is unreliable analysis more than that is high risk. Next, have a fail fast step so that your developers uh, are not very, are not becoming frustrated from the long running uh, process of the canary analysis. Um, make your changes backwards compatible so that you don't get into the deadlock state. Make the canary process visible as much as possible. From my experience, it's never enough. Even with everything I showed you here, we still need more visibility. Um, finally, enable your developers to act upon that visibility on the information they digest so that they can override the process, skip it, roll back manually, and so on. So during these 30 minutes, I mean, I, there's a lot more I can't, I, I can't talk about, but because of the time limitation, I'm unable to. 
Um, for more information about this topic specifically, you can scan that barcode, which sends you to a blog post I wrote about the same topic, but different aspect, uh, more details. And thank you guys so much for listening.